you're a 19-year-old kid. You are critically wounded and dying in the jungle somewhere in the central highlands of Vietnam. It's November 11, 1967, landing zone x-ray. Your unit is outnumbered eight to one and the enemy fire is so intense from only 100 yards away that your CO has ordered the medevac helicopters to stop coming in. You're lying there listening to the enemy machine guns and you know you're not getting out. Your family is halfway around the world, 12,000 miles away and you'll never see them again. As the world starts to fade in and out, you know this is the day. Then, over the machine gun noise, you faintly hear that sound, the sound of a helicopter. You look up to see a Huey coming in, but it doesn't seem real because no medevac markings are on it. Captain Ed Freeman is coming in for you. He's not medevac, so it's not his job. But he heard the radio call and decided he's flying his Huey down into the machine gun fire anyway. Even after the medevacs were ordered not to come, he's coming anyway. And Captain Ed Freeman drops it in and sits there in the machine gun fire as they load three of you at a time on board. Then he flies you up and out through the gunfire to the doctors and nurses and safety. And he kept coming back 13 more times until all the wounded were out. No one knew until the mission was over that the captain had been hit four times himself in the legs and the left arm. He took 29 of you and your buddies out that day. Some would not have made it without the captain and his Huey. Medal of Honor recipient, Captain Ed Freeman, United States Air Force, died last Wednesday at the age of 70 in Boise, Idaho. Quite a different story from that of those disciples, huh? They still had it in mind after all that Jesus had taught them and told them. They still had it in mind that somehow he was going to pull victory out of the jaws of defeat when, when that traitor Judas and those soldiers and such came to arrest him with their swords and their clubs. But winning that particular little skirmish in the garden on that particular day would have lost him the war. And so Jesus had Peter put down his sword. And he let the other side win. This wasn't what the disciples expected. They, they were still just having it in mind that this was not how it was going to go, not with their Jesus, not with their Messiah, their Christ. And so when there wasn't going to be a fight, when there weren't going to be these legions of angels dropping out of the sky to crush the Romans and the Pharisees and anyone else that had gotten in Jesus' way, when that was not going to happen, it was abundantly obvious to the disciples that it was not going to happen. What did they do? They, all of them, all of the, those disciples deserted him and fled. Would you have done any different? I mean, would, would you have stayed? Would you have, have you know, tried something to, to keep this from happening. It amuses me when, when I hear Christians in, in our modern day world say, oh, not me, if I had been there, I would have remained faithful and I would have stood there. Right. Who are we kidding? These guys spent three years of their lives with Jesus every single moment of every single day. They had heard all of the great teachings that he taught and not just as some wandering preacher, but he taught with authority 
with power, with strength in his voice. And then they had seen all of these miracles that he had performed. They were the ones who were in the boat out on the lake when the storm whips up and there's wind and there's waves and they're scared to death. And who is it that comes out to them walking on the water, mind you? And not only does he demonstrate that kind of power, pulls Peter up when Peter tries it, but then issues his orders to the wind and the waves to calm down, and they do. They saw this. They knew what he was capable of when all of creation obeys his orders. Or when he's healing blind men or deaf men or paralyzed men. So much so that they get up and walk for the first times in their lives. These guys had seen this. And let's not forget Lazarus. His friend Lazarus, who had been dead four days. And Jesus tells Lazarus to come on out of the grave. And the dead man walks. These guys had seen all of this. They had heard all of this. And yet in this moment of truth, they deserted him. They ran away. They were more concerned about themselves. They were more concerned about something, anything other than Jesus Christ. Who are we to think we would be any different? The key word today, it's very simple. It's the word stay. Stay with Jesus. Stay where you are. Stay where he's brought you. Stay on the path upon which he is walking with you. Stay. No matter who's coming at you with clubs and swords, stay. No matter how dark this garden would be, stay. No matter how threatening it would be to your own personal comfort or even your own personal life, stay. Unlike his best friends, his disciples. And it comes a line from Hamlet that the fear of death makes cowards of us all. Yeah, they all deserted Jesus because they probably thought they were next and they were probably right. Because the Romans, especially as they're being spurred on by the Pharisees and the council leaders, the Romans would have had no problem slapping up some extra crosses for Peter and the boys. And that was probably running through their mind. The fear of death makes cowards of us all. And so they run and they hide. Faith isn't faith when it's only for the good. When it's only in the light. When it's only giving us what we desire. That's not faith. Faith stands up. Faith stands out. Faith stays with Jesus and with what he has set out to do for us. Because none of this that he does, none of it he's doing for himself. Oh, yes, people all the time will volunteer to take nails and thorns and a spear through their side for somebody else. We see that on a daily basis. No. Never, in all of the things Jesus said to his disciples, never did he promise them that all of this was going to be easy. No, the Son of Man must be betrayed. And given over in the hands of sinful men. And then, as if that's not bad enough, he will be crucified, he will be killed. But the disciples thought he was going to win. They just couldn't see the whole game plan and they didn't realize that this was going to go to overtime. So they deserted him. And see, this is the thing. They probably had an accurate view of things that perhaps their lives would be next. 
But you see, you and I back down, you and I back away, you and I will flee from Jesus and from his truth and from his life. Let, never mind when our lives would, would be ended, when our lives are even inconvenienced or disrupted. We go for the faith of convenience. We, we don't want to be looked at as funny or as nerdish or as stupid or whatever else other people will think of Christians. And so rather... Rather than stay with Jesus and stand up for what we believe and who we believe in, what do we do? We back down. We try to shrink our Christianity. Hide it, disguise it. So, so you know, well, we're, we're not all like those religious people, like those church people. Uh, yeah, you know, I go to church, but, um, but I don't do all of that stuff. Because Why? We want to blend in with the people, the clubs and swords, more than we want to stay with Jesus Christ. Because staying might get uncomfortable. Staying with Jesus might, might just be a little difficult. And we might lose some relationships over this. Or, God help us, we might be rejected or made fun of. You cannot hide faith and have it still be faith you cannot disguise it in the costume of the world and have it still be faith and there is no such thing as camouflage christianity think about this we are living in a world filled with people with all sorts of swords and clubs we are living in a world filled with people who have ho no hope, no reason for living, and they want to drag us down to their level. And what are, we, are, what are we tempted to do? To join with them? Let it not be. Faith stands up and stands out not because you and I are such good believers, not because we practice this discipleship in such powerful and wonderful ways on a daily basis. No, it stands up and it stands out because Jesus sticks with the plan. Here's the thing, Jesus stays. The disciples deserted him and fled. They ran out of the garden. Jesus stayed in the garden. He stayed within the clutches of those Roman soldiers and the temple guard. He stayed on the path to his trial before Pilate. He stayed on the road to Calvary, and he stayed with it all the way up that hill, and he stayed with it with nails in his flesh. Jesus stays. He stays with the plan that his father had in the first place. And the plan was never to overthrow the Roman government. The plan was never to establish a Christian government to somehow evangelize the powers and authorities of this world and establish some sort of new theocracy. That was not Jesus' plan then, and it's not his plan now. His plan was to be the savior of the world and in order to save the world and each and every soul in it, he had to stay with the mission that his father had determined for him. Even as he prayed, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, Jesus prays to his father, not my will, but your will be done. He stays. He stays with the purpose for which the Savior establishes himself in the hearts and lives of those whom he's called and chosen. His purpose is to reconnect you and me to the God of our salvation, to rebuild the relationships in our lives, starting with the relationship with God himself that have been broken by our own sinfulness. That is his purpose. To gather together for God a people who, as weak as they are from time to time, and for as often as they desert and flee, are still loved by God with such power and with such depth 
that God's ability to love, forgive, and save is far greater, infinitely more powerful than our ability to stay here and be faithful. And Jesus stays with us. He stays with his people. He stays with us even when we do try to run and hide. What does he do? He comes and finds us. He stays with us when we try to back down or blend in. And what does he do? He lifts us up again and he restores in us the strength of faith and the courage of knowing that he is with us always as he has promised. He stays with us when we come into his house to hear that voice of love and power. He stays with us to give us the two things that no one else in the world can ever get. None of those people holding those clubs or swords had it or knew what they were. None of those people who were chanting crucify, who were cheering on his execution, none of them had those things. And none of the people living around us these days who are trying to drag us down into their pit of sin and darkness, they don't know what these things are either. But Jesus gives them to us for free through his death and then through his refusal to stay dead. And that is hope and joy. The two things that set Christianity apart from every other human religion. Hope. Like the young man waiting for that medevac helicopter that he thought would never come. Knowing that Jesus is going to stay faithful to his promise to you and to me. We have that hope, that certainty that God is who he is and he's going to do what he has promised and he has never failed us. He might not do it in a timely fashion as much as we would like. We would, might, we would really like to have God be a little faster. But he delivers. We have that hope. And then we have this joy. This joy in knowing that no matter what the world and life in it throw at us, we will be victorious we will triumph because Jesus did when he walked out of that tomb. We have the joy of knowing that nothing in all creation now can separate us from this love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. So here's what we know. about Jesus. He's here. Right here. Right with us as he has promised to be. And if we can't hear his voice, well, maybe he's letting us have our time to talk. But he's still here. And yet, of course, yeah, we are going to step back from time to time, step away, maybe even walk away. And we have that constant invitation from Jesus to come back. Because he never stops loving, he never stops forgiving, he never stops opening that door for you and for me to get our life back. And so what does he tell us? When you come back, stay here. Stay with me. Stay where the strength is. Stay where you know you have a boundless, never-ending supply of hope and joy. Stay where my grace overflows to you. Stay. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are not always very good at being the Christian you've called us to be. Sometimes, Lord, 
we would like to hide. We would like to step away from the discomfort, from the outright challenge that we experience from people who don't know you, from people who are clearly enemies of our God and Savior. Lord, forgive us when we fail. Forgive us when we flee. Forgive us our moments of cowardice. And fill us up again with that grace we need, that grace that does bring that forgiveness that you bought and paid for with your own blood. That grace that strengthens us, not with something called willpower, but with the power of God. And Lord Jesus, by that same grace, bring us back and keep us here where it's safe, where it is victorious. In your name, Christ Jesus. Amen.